You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Last week our focus was on the state budget squeeze in Kentucky, particularly as it impacts schools. But if Kentucky has a budget problem, Ohio has a full-fledged budget crisis. The underlying causes are the same, an extended economic slowdown resulting in depressed tax revenues, combined with rising expectations for Medicare, Medicaid, and school funding. On Wednesday, the Ohio Senate adopted a budget correction for the current fiscal year that ends June 30th. The Senate budget, which is very similar to one adopted earlier by the House, does not contain any of Governor Taft's recommended $159 million of tax increases on cigarettes or alcohol, or a proposed 1% increase in state income tax he floated as an alternative. Without any new taxes, Taft believes that, the Ohio, that Ohio still faces a $162 million shortfall over the next four months and has threatened to impose drastic cuts in elementary, secondary, and higher education as well as senior services. And this does not even mention uh, the much bigger problems the state faces in the biennium budget that begins July 1. To discuss where Ohio stands and where it goes from here, I am joined by Patricia Clancy, the Republican floor leader of the Ohio House, representing the 29th district, covering a portion of north central area of Hamilton County, and Steve Driehaus, a Democratic member of the Ohio House, representing the 31st district, which covers portions of the west side of the city of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. The Senate just passed a budget on Wednesday, as I mentioned. It's a little bit different than the version that passed in the House. Uh, Patricia, what, what's the essence of that difference without going into every detail? Well, it was mainly the same version that the House passed uh, the week prior. However, there were two probably significant changes in many people's minds, and one of those was it eliminated the $30 million recommendation to cut local government funds from our part of the budget that the, the governor suggested that we do. So the Senate placed that back into the bill so that the governor really does have now the opportunity to cut $30 million out of the local government fund. And it also had a... No, wait a minute. I, I want to be clear. The Senate cut it out. You kept it in and the Senate cut it out we, or vice versa? We kept it in so you, that okay. there could be no cuts to now, the local government fund. And when you say local government, are we talking about townships? Are we talking about... Yes. Does this also cover libraries, for The example? local government fund that includes the funding for the libraries as well. Okay. Yes. So, and we all know in Hamilton County that we just have gone through a crisis this past year with a correction now. Yes. Th so that one of the differences here is $30 million yes. between House and Senate. Steve, how's that get resolved? How do you... When you have two different versions of a budget, what happens? Well, it, the Senate version has to come back to the House for a vote on the Senate amendments. If the, if the House concurs with those amendments, then the bill goes on to the governor. If, if the House doesn't agree with those amendments, then it goes to conference committee. Uh, I've heard talk in the Senate that they feel that they've come a long way towards the House version, so they would appreciate a concurrence with the amendments. Um, uh, I think, you know, for me, I, I voted against the bill when it left the House, and I'll vote against, against it again when it comes back. Because? Uh, well, because, uh, you know, there was a provision in the bill which uh, many of the Democrats find very disturbing, which has to do with uh, the child care that we offer to low-income individuals. And we have a lot of working moms who are trying to get off of welfare, trying to do the right thing. And what we did was we took the level of poverty from 185 percent to 150 percent, and the director can take it even lower than that. We tried to cap it at 150 percent so that we wouldn't lower the benefit any further than that. Um, we lost that amendment on the floor of the House, and for many of us, that was a deal breaker because uh, I don't think we need to be balancing this budget on the backs of you know poor working mothers. Patricia, uh, did you vote for the budget when it was in I the did. House? I did. I voted for the budget because I felt that that was the responsible thing to do. We had a plan in the House as the majority party to look at this entire budget. First of all, let me just explain that this was a budget correction bill. Right. This has nothing to do with the next biennial budget. This is just getting through the next four that's months. That's right. Just getting through up until June 30th. However, I voted for it because there is estimates from $720 million that we need to plug, a hole that we need to plug, 
to $651 million. So there is obviously a hole in the budget, and our state constitution requires that we have a balanced budget. So yeah. we need to do something. But even if you resolve the difference between the Senate and the House, as I understand it, even taking the best version of that, the most favorable version, there's still, you've reduced that hole, but it, there, isn't there still 160 yes. million approximately? Yes, that's true. Well, then how can that be responsible to, to, to because, still have a hole? Well, let me explain. Because the House had a plan that we, in fact, would give these um, uh, possible solutions to the governor so that he could make additional cuts to the budget. But what we thought was more responsible, instead of adding the alcohol and the cigarette tax, we thought that we would prefer to wait until April the 15th. April the 15th is a very significant date in Ohio. It's obviously when income taxes right. are due. We thought we would be really getting into the meat of our next biennial budget. We'd have better budget uh, figures at that time. We would have been able to spend some time in actually delving into the proposals. And therefore, we thought that we would have an option at that time if we waited without increasing the cigarette mm -hmm. and the alcohol tax. We thought that we would have, still a have better time handle on it and we would still have time for an adjustment if one was needed. Let's, do. let's make it clear. Uh, no one in, in the House is going to vote for the cigarette and alcohol taxes, neither Democrats nor Republicans. So that's just a dead issue. Right. And, and so it's not as if you do this or, or you vote for tax increases. What was crystal clear when this bill went through is that they held out the possibility that they would vote for a one cent sales tax increase in mid-April, which I'm, I'm very much opposed to. And, and the, the notion Republicans that The Republicans would? Is that, is that one of the things you were well, holding at? I just, very quickly. Is that, that was one thing that was discussed, but there was no provision in that bill to not, say that was look, a guarantee. After April 15th. We're taking one-time funds from different places, from unclaimed funds, from rotary funds, from, uh, you know, from our rainy day fund. We're not cutting the waste in government which is what we all want to do. We're not going after the huge number of SUVs that you know, government employees are driving. We're not going un after the unbid contracts, which are costing us hundreds of millions of dollars every year. We're not going after the huge you know, expenditures, the tax expenditures, that are really blowing a hole in the budget. We didn't do any of that. So no. when we say it's the responsible <laughs> thing, you know, you know, I question that. Steve <laughs> sounds like a good Republican there, budget cutter. Well, do you agree with that? But you fail to mention that one of the things that he has already stated, the reason why he did not vote for this budget correction is because it did include a cut to child care. Well, it, Which you doesn't have, impact this fiscal cannot, year at all. You cannot have it both ways. You have to either make some very, very serious cuts, and quite frankly, we have looked at the, the waste, we have cut out fat. As a matter of fact, over the last two years, uh, we have cut nearly two billion dollars well, out of state funding for agencies. Uh, Patricia, are you saying that the Republicans will support a tax increase after April 15th? No, I'm not saying that because we do not know what will happen. What we thought was a very positive sign is that we said April 15th is a very significant date we will have better projections okay. at that time. We want to wait so and see. So we're going see. to put it off till April 15th to decide what to do, basically, well, yes, is your but, approach. But there could be okay. a reason, a very good reason to do that, and that is that... To what extent is this struggle right now a reflection of the loss of influence of Bob Taft as governor, even within his own party? I, I think clearly Bob Taft... I mean, there seems to be no direction in the state. You've got Republican leadership in the House, Republican leadership in the Senate, and a Republican governor as well as the other state officers. They can't agree on anything. And, and they don't bring the Democrats to the table at all. You know, we see these bills when they arrive in finance that, as omnibus amendments the right. night before we're supposed to vote on them. Patricia? That, you know, Steve, come on. That is <laughs> not exactly true. Well, let's not worry uh, about <laughs> when the Democrats see it. What about the relationship of the governor to the to the Republican leadership in the legislator, legislature. Well, though. we did have some concerns about the figures that were being brought forward. The governor wanted us to act immediately. I think that that would have been irresponsible. We thought that it was certainly going to be better at this time to wait until that April uh, deadline again and see whether or not okay. we can have better projections and have a better plan on how to fill the budget. I, I want to. We've been talking about the budget correction up till June, and I've got 
only about two minutes left here. <laughs> we haven't even touched. <laughs> we, we haven't even touched where we go for our, the next biennium, which is the really hard one. Right now, realistically, even if we wait till after after April fifteenth to figure out what we're going to do for the rest of this fiscal year, what are we facing in terms of either more in, more cuts or more taxes? for the next biennium. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because certainly we have to set the stage right now. If we have absolutely no help and um, no suggestions by the Democratic Party in the last budget and the, also in all the other corrections. Wait bills, a minute. Look, they, I'll introduce a bill they, next week. They but, did not supply one single vote. Now, yeah. they complain in the last budget, they complain yeah, that we Dan, cut everything. Wait, Steve, one, one, of the biggest reasons, one of the biggest reasons revenues are falling in the state of Ohio is because we're giving ex exemptions and credits across the board for every tax. And, and it's really blowing a huge hole. We forego $10 billion in tax revenue every year in the state of Ohio. So what we propose is to phase some of those out, make it more responsible. Let's let's measure whether or not these tax expenditures are working. Yet we can't seem to get that through. And, and it has bipartisan support, so I, I don't quite understand. But do Democrats never help out? No, we're more than happy to help out. We're not allowed in the room. So, so to that, you're right, we don't vote for it because we're completely excluded from the process. So the Democrats have succeeded in cutting things like Wait, look, the, the Republicans. Uh, aid to the elderly. The Republicans they are in charge of everything, and they want to blame the Democrats for the fiscal woes the state of Ohio is. Under Republican and leadership, we've well, doubled the final, size of state government. Final yeah. comment. It, for, for it sure. works both ways. It works both ways. You cannot say that you want to cut everything and not increase any taxes and then complain that the government has increased in size so dramatically that you cannot participate. You just have to have I'm, a plan I'm more than that happy is to participate. consistent and also one I, that helps deal with I the budget issues. I have to say, whether it's, it's Democratic representatives or Democratic senators over the past few years that I've had on this show, they will consistently say, on camera and off camera, they're just not in the room to even make when the decisions are being made. I mean, I, I mean, the reality is the Republicans do have an overwhelming majority. We do have a majority. At the same time, in this last budget correction, I think that, that the Speaker really reached over the aisle, uh, extended a hand right. for cooperation, and... Um, <laughs> This is great. This is, this is a demonstration of what the struggle is, I mean, in, in Columbus. And I mean, good information. Thank you for being here this morning. Thanks, and Dad. by the way, solve those problems, and none of us like taxes. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned. After the break, a little historical perspective on the current Homeland Security push. Even at home, you can effectively defend yourself. Elsie, where are you? I'm closing off the upstairs. Good. Get down from there as soon as you can. Close all the windows, draw the blinds, and pull the drapes in front of them. That'll keep out fire sparks and glass splinters if the windows break. Close all the doors behind you, too. We've got to make this place practically airtight. Now listen, kids, if they're dropping an atomic bomb, it may go off any second now. Whatever happens, I'll give the signal when it's all right for us to get up. If there's an explosion, we'll wait about a minute after it's all over, then we'll go upstairs and take a look around, see if it's all right for us to clean up. So now we're asking you to write an emergency plan, buy supplies, and hang a list of contact numbers on the wall. Terrorists force us to make a choice. We can be afraid or we can be ready. Americans aren't afraid and we will be ready. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Beginning with World War II, increasing uh, with the dawn of the nuclear age and the peaks in, of tension during the Cold War and ramping up exponentially since 9-11, Americans have been searching for more than half a century for ways to believe that we can protect ourselves from the threats of military attack on our homes that the rest of the world has lived with on a day-by-day -day basis for centuries. This past Wednesday, Tom Ridge, the Secretary of Homeland Security, 
spoke in Cincinnati about what the government thinks we should do to protect ourselves against the terrorist threats of chemical, biological, and small, dirty nuclear devices. In an effort to place this latest incarnation of civil defense in historical context, I am joined this morning by Alan Winkler, professor of history at Miami University and the author of Life Under a Cloud, American Anxiety About the Atom as well as books on the home front and the politics of propaganda during World War II. Alan, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Nice to be here. Has the United States historically ever had a coherent, effective civil defense program? Not really. There was an Office of Civilian Defense during World War II, which didn't do a great deal. It was more aimed at trying to promote good morale. In the 19, late 1940s and the 1950s, there were civil defense efforts, but they're very much like they, were, they are today in that these were aimed at trying to get people aware that there was a threat, but the reality was that the things that the government was asking people to do didn't go very far and didn't mean very much. What were some of the things that, there were various theories about what America and Americans could do. What were some of those? Immediately after World War II, when the first atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the government talked about the need to disperse industry and government buildings and get them out of the central cities, move them out of downtown Washington. And that lasted for a while, but it wasn't a very practical alternative. Expensive. Expensive. Then there was an effort to promote the building of blast shelters that would protect against the earliest nuclear weapons. But that was prohibitively expensive. They were talking about $32 billion at a time when the Manhattan Project had only cost $2 billion. So that wasn't real. And largely because of that, the government began cajoling people, the old duck and cover campaigns. There was a turtle, and his name was Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert, and people should be like Bert the turtle and, and take shelter <laughs> in, in a crisis. And that meant hiding under your desk if you were in school. It meant covering your head up to try to protect yourselves from a blast. And that, too, wasn't very realistic. And that's, with that 19, that's in the spirit of that 1950 film that we, we've shown a couple mm -hmm. of clips from. We're going to show one more at the end. Exactly. Um, there was also, and I think it, sometimes we take things for granted and we forget how they were seen at the beginning. The interstate system was even seen, which we just take as a transportation system today, was seen as part of civil defense, right? Absolutely, because after people sort of gave up on the idea of cajoling the public, they decided to get people out of the central cities if a bomb fell. And you needed highways to do that. And the Interstate Highway Act of 1956 was justified on the grounds that this was a way of getting people out of the, out of the center of the towns. Uh, from duck and cover, it went to run like hell, as the, <laughs> as the people said. Wasn't part of that also, in the interstate, wasn't part of that theory, and I didn't see this in your book, that justified partially in the idea that we could put missiles on mobile carriers and move them around on the interstate system as well, mm -hmm. which sounds mm -hmm. like what we're accusing the Iraqis mm -hmm. of today. Mm -hmm. uh, but So the interstate system also had an offensive element as well as a defensive could, element. Could, and, and that developed over time, and that was clearly part of the, the overall picture as well. These sorts of views, I thought, gee, I, I remember them as a kid mm -hmm, growing up in too. the 50s and the 60s, but I thought they had died out. But I was talking to my children about this just this, this week. They grew up in the 80s in grade school. They remember doing duck and cover. Mm -hmm. So this, this actually had a long life. In the 80s, as the Reagan administration began its big defense buildup and began talking about the possibility of a nuclear war and as the scenarios of catastrophe were, were evident everywhere, a member of the administration by the name of T.K. Jones said, you know, anybody can survive a nuclear attack. Just, you know, dig a hole, cover it with a couple of boards, and, and you can be safe. And that led to a kind of recurrence of the, of the ideology and the theory that, that you could survive one of these things. All of this seems, I mean, all of these theories seem to be blown apart, literally, as we came to a better understanding of radiation and mm -hmm. nuclear uh, uh, winter and all of those things. To what extent was this really about propaganda versus about a real strategy of defense? I think propaganda had a great deal to do with it because the most serious critics and the most realistic observers believed quite clearly that, that you weren't going to be able to protect yourself in the event of an attack. And yet you wanted your public to be aware of the dangers involved. You wanted people not to be cavalier about the possibilities of a holocaust. And therefore, encouragement to take these kinds of actions, I think, fed right into that mentality. As you hear 
the things that have been said about civil defense today, and now the, the weapons isn't, aren't so much huge nuclear weapons on the top of ICBMs as they are uh, biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons, dirty nuclear weapons, small bombs that are going to affect a relatively small area but be very dirty in terms of radiation. How does what's being said right now sound to your ear given the research that you've done? It has an amazing echo because the unreality of being able to protect yourself by covering your head with your hands or by crawling under your desk seems to me very much the same kind of thing as the, as the unreality of, of protecting yourself with plastic sheeting and duct tape. Fundamentally, in the event of a real attack, those things aren't going to do very much good at all. But the notion is that somehow you get people aware of them and, and cognizant of them, and, and that's going to be OK. During these decades since the uh, nuclear cloud, mm -hmm. as, as you refer to it, um, covered America, were there people who said, you know, this whole civil defense approach doesn't make sense? Scientific people who said, you know, the voices of saying this isn't the right theory, that we need a different strategy, which is really controlling the, 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 the war itself, right? Absolutely. There, there were scientists and there were policymakers who said this kind of protection is simply not going to work. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of time. We would be far better dealt with by devoting our energies to, to dealing with the causes of war, to trying to arrange for nuclear disarmament, to try to arrange for a reduction of missile capabilities and, and, and the like. And this is the only realistic way of, of ultimately dealing with that threat, that these kind of protective band-aids aren't going to do any good at all. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning to me that your book has recently been translated into Japanese. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, the Japanese, uh, the people on whom the first two and only atomic bombs have fallen, are, are very much interested in these issues. Uh, Japanese historians and scholars and members of the public are concerned about why the bombs were dropped initially back in 1945, about the possibilities of other weaponry, and there's a kind of ongoing, almost haunting interest in that, and I think that led to the, to the translation. I think one of the things that's important to remember is that after those bombs were dropped, the average person had very little, and maybe even policymakers, had very little understanding of what actually they were dealing with at that point. I mean, it took a long, I mean, we're talking decades before people really understood the concept of radiation, right? Absolutely. First of all, the, the, the Manhattan Project developing the bombs was top secret, and so the public didn't have any inkling of that. But even scientists at the Manhattan Project weren't clearly aware of, of the lethal dangers of radiation. Scientists climbed into the crater at Alamogordo and went into Nagasaki and Hiroshima right after the bombs dropped without really being aware of the effects on their own bodies. Only later, by the late 1940s, by the 1950s, with the discovery of fallout, did we really become very much aware of, of what those dangers were. Hmm. I, I ran across a letter in my own research of a American missionary who was living in Tokyo at the time, lived through the entire war in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. She was married to a Japanese. She writes a couple days after Hiroshima, it refers to it as an electron bomb. Don't mm -hmm. even know what mm -hmm. name to call this thing right, yet. Right, right. The Japanese didn't know what hit them, but they knew it was some kind of a new weapon. And Japanese scientists were cognizant about the atom being split and the kinds of things that were going on. And they were the ones who put two and two together. But the public didn't really have a clue. Let me just add, and we got less than a minute. Practically speaking, what are you doing personally in response to the duct tape, plastic, home kit, whatever? I have very little duct tape in my house. I have very little plastic sheeting. I'm doing my best to try to hope and speak out in, in, in the hope that we can somehow manage to avoid the kind of war that, that, that looms. I'm aware of the threat of terrorist activity and, and haunted by 9-11. But other than that, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Thank you for being here this morning. Thanks very and much. And we're going to uh, you know, take another look at a little bit of, of tape here Great. from that 1950 film. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week for a discussion of the Cincinnati Playhouse in the Parks production of Paradise, a wonderful play, by the way. Have a good week. Joe, finish tacking this blanket for me, will you? Sure. And when you're finished, you'll have to wash your hands thoroughly.
I think I got a little breeze just now. A nice cool breeze of radioactive mist. Now, folks, watch while I give a demonstration of how to defend yourself against lingering radioactivity. First, you remove all the clothing you think might be contaminated. Then you scrub every part of you that you think might be contaminated. Once, twice, and again. You think you've got a bad dad? No, I don't think so, son. But if I have, I'm not going to have it bad very long. That's the whole idea of this scrubbing. If you get a little radiation, don't let it stay with you long enough for it to build up its dirty work. Because that's one way radiation can make you sick. If a little of it gets to you and stays with you long enough, it can do almost as much damage over a long period of time as one big dose all at once. If you're radioactive right now, Daddy, does that mean that we can catch it from you? No, Meg, I've got it all to myself. Do you think we'll be...